everyone and welcome back. Um, so this is lecture two, talking about Uncle Tom's Cabin, and we're going to focus on sentimentality, social change, and some of the other major themes of the book. Um, last time, I think there may have been a little problem with my microphone. I'm hoping that that's been fixed now. Um, it's not horrible. It's just it was a tiny bit loud, and I'm loud already. So there we have Tom and little Eva. Again, we talked about them last time and their friendship. Um, so what are some of the major themes of the book? Well, I mentioned this before that the author focuses on ripping families apart. Family and the domestic sphere, the domestic sphere meaning the home, both of these things are going to be extremely important to the author. So Stowe wants to show that African Americans could have solid family structures if granted their freedom. This is going to be particularly true of families where we have Christians. And so that's it kind of ties into one of the other themes of religion and Christianity. But what she tries to do is show a series of domestic scenes where we have for example, in the beginning, Mr. and Mrs. Shelby, the slave owners who live on the plantation. Then we move into Eliza's home um, with Harry and her husband, George, who is from a neighboring plantation. Then we have um, Uncle Tom's home where we see Uncle Tom with his wife and their children. And so we're supposed to make comparisons between the white families and the African American families, the slave families. And then we are supposed to feel quite emotional when these nearly happy families are are torn apart so she uses the breaking of families to further sentiment and that's going to be an important word i'm going to circle it sentiment now sentimentality the dictionary definition is basically like exaggerated self-indulgent feelings of sadness or tenderness or sympathy um and this is the tradition in which she is writing, the sentimental tradition. I will talk a little bit more about that in my next lecture, but just to keep this in mind, she's trying to persuade readers by using sympathy. There we go. Got a little messy there. By using sympathy and sentiment, so showing the happiness and then immediately dragging us into this place of despair when these families are broken up. Similarly, communities are broken up when one slave is forced to leave. So these small communities where all of the slaves are living in small houses, quite close to each other. Um, how are the other people affected? Uncle Tom is beloved in the community. He is doing um, Bible studies in one of the places where he lives. So when he leaves, that breaks up the, um, the, the stability of the community. This is a photo. I'm going to zoom in here so you guys can see this better. Um, yeah, this is a photo of one of those communities. So it's not coming out great here because it's so old. But you can see the, the houses right here, right? Um, the people doing work. Here we're hitching up an ox. Here we've got a different ox cart. The women are doing wash over here together, possibly sewing. And then the kids are here um, either resting or playing for, for a brief moment. In other works, um, there's a tradition of a mother murdering her children rather than seeing them sold into the slave trade. And I have a poem for you guys that I'm going to link up um, that where you can see that theme. And we do have a minor character where this occurs and we get to hear her story. The idea being, um, and this was something that did indeed happen um there are records of this happening um a woman in one case throwing her child off of a boat when they were um, on their way to be sold to slavery and in another case um, i believe it was poison so the idea is that 
can we blame them for committing infanticide for 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 committing child murder um when the horrors of what will happen to their children they know what will happen um the the girls will possibly if they are they will possibly be enslaved for sexual purposes um the boys will be possibly outdoors beaten and and whipped and everything else and so this is the point that these people have come to in their desperation and this is what stowe is trying to show now many people criticized her for showing these scenes and being too sentimental and she responded by publishing a key to uncle tom's cabin which showed exactly where she had gotten her source is that this is not um completely in the romantic tradition which again i'll talk more about next time so gentlemen and ladies women and men again i'm going to zoom in on this picture here um, a painting of a man being brought out and his his baby kissing him goodbye he leaves in chains so white gentlemen are kind to their wives kind to their slaves and usually either christian or morally sound in this book in contrast slave traders are rough and rude they have thicker accents they view slaves in terms only of monetary value um, they're disliked by true gentlemen and ladies there are also african-american men who are gentlemen they are shown to be superior to these rough men um so one of the things that she's doing with this to try to convince her readers is to show that not all of the people in the south are rough and rude and cruel right not all of them are but that the people who believe that they are kind are still to blame for this problem and so what people might read the book and say well if it were just if every slave owner in this book was completely cruel then it would be easy for someone to say well that book doesn't apply to me because i'm not like that with my slaves they're almost like part of my family and i would never do such a thing right and she's saying no no you're still culpable you're still sinning by having slaves you're still evil by having slaves just because you have the refinement of manners doesn't mean that you're not still culpable but um it does show too all of the different types of people who had slaves um, but she's not trying to excuse their behavior she's really trying to appeal to people who are in those situations to show too you don't know even if you feel like you're being kind you're still dictating these people's lives and you don't know what might happen we have one kind character or seemingly kind who dies and then what happens to his estate we have another who has um money troubles and and has to sell slaves and really almost has no choice or he'll lose the entire farm so these are the issues that she is trying to show and she's also trying to show that some of these slaves are better than the people who are their masters their so-called masters women couldn't vote i mentioned this before but that does not mean that they did not have power um female empowerment existed even before the vote so look for strong female characters and the white women who are depicted how are they trying to use their influence in these domestic settings in particular so in these homes how are they changing the hearts minds and lives and even legislation because they can't vote but they can influence the the men in their lives who do so this the the first is really an appeal to the male readers to say hey you may think you're kind but let's rethink that and the second is really an appeal to the female readers how can you have power just at, in your home how can you change the world by changing your household and that's really kind of a, a quite an inspiring and powerful idea especially to women um, at that time all right so another major theme christianity here we have 
a um a black man who is preaching mostly to slaves and possibly to um some of the the people at the house um watch for characters who claim that they are christians some people falsely use religion to continue enslavement so it's kind of as an excuse um others who are abolitionists or have sentiments toward abolition so that meaning that they kind of feel like it's not right that people are enslaved but yet this is the system we have and i don't quite know what to do or how to change it um they're showing christian charity and kindness so things like teaching them how to read allowing them to have prayer meetings like this one at one point tom is leading prayer meetings in a bible study um there tom is perhaps the most christ-like in the novel particularly near the end so look for sacrifices that he's making look for ways that he shows things like patience and endurance and long suffering and humility and gentleness and kindness and those types of traits the author is also making it plain that eliza and her husband well her husband to maybe a lesser extent um and eliza chastises him for it they're also strong christians most closer to much closer to god than some of their white masters no matter how their kind their masters may seem it's very clear the author makes it very clear a true christian would not be a slaveholder and she also is trying to show that some of the slaves are christians and they follow their morals much more closely than the white men who claim to do the same now this is to me one of the key points of the book because we talked about sentimentality and what she's trying to do is have this idea um fight the idea rather i'm sorry there was an idea at the time that the slaves were heathens from africa and that we had gotten them from africa um we meaning people in the united states they were brought from africa and they um could be enslaved because they weren't of the same faith there that was sort of an underlying idea at the time they didn't know anything and so they were kind of conquered or taken for for partially that reason there's also this idea um in transcendentalism that you have every person has the light of god inside of them or the potential for that light and so you can do things to feed your soul to grow spiritually um that could be formally through christianity or it could not be and come to a place of betterment that you can better yourself and the other thing that you can do is stamp that light out so you do things to move further away from god move further away from your better self to not transcend your circumstances so transcendentalism is going to be important here because she's trying to show that these are people who have this light inside of them if if you are a christian you would call it the holy spirit if you're not you would kind of say like the light inside of each person or um that spark inside every every person right and if that is the case then being enslaved is putting that light out it is dampening their humanity it is hurting their spirituality and because of that this system of slavery is evil because we should encourage every person to be more spiritual to be closer to god to be a better person and a better man so things like at one point tom is learning to read then we have other slave owner owners who don't allow the bible and don't allow reading and um that is taken away from him right the the beatings and the um the basically torturing and lowering his soul to a point of depression that those are things that are putting out that light right ripping somebody apart from their family is putting out that light so look for that sentimentality how is she saying these are people who are human <laughs> and, and they're being looked at as three-fifths of a person and they are human and we're hurting their humanity 
Another theme is sexual violence. There's no overt sex in the novel, but there are several references to slave owners raping their female slaves and selling the children who result from those rapes. We're going to see that again in Frederick Douglass, where it's a little bit more apparent as to what's going on. Um, Cassie, we talked about last time, describes her life. She was in love with her first master, and then he met a white woman, and she and her children were sold. Then she was involved in sex trafficking, where she was abused by several different masters. And then Emmeline is a slave brought in for the same purpose. So in addition, um, there are slaves, just to know these terms, when slaves are described, and we're going to see again in Frederick Douglass later, um, quadroon means they are one quarter African, um, mulatto is half so at some point, if they're half, their fathers were white. And if they're quadroon, their grandfathers were white. So it's very important as well um, for a couple of reasons. Because Stowe is showing that this is perpetuating the problem and that this is causing um, men to sin, also the white men to sin, and to have their humanity lessened by these sins. But also, to, to an unfortunate degree, we are supposed to feel more sympathy for some of the characters because they are part white. So just know that, you know, th this isn't a book where the author has perfectly done everything. She is still a product of the thoughts of her time, including a few more that I'm going to talk about later. Um... But yes, look for those terms. Okay, so what is the impact of this book? The readers empathize with the enslaved characters. That was her goal. So she is using sentiment to show the humanity of these characters and to, to connect with readers who are still stuck in that very rational um you know we talked about the age of enlightenment and then how that is different right from from the romantic period where we're looking at feelings so she wants people not just to look at things logically but to connect with them emotionally and readers definitely empathize with these characters. They freely debated the cause of slavery, the fugitive slave law in the book, the future of freed people, when an individual could do racism. Um, all of these things are debated in the book and, and readers definitely did respond. There's a legend that Abraham Lincoln greeted her by saying, um, so you're the little woman who wrote the book that started this great war. Whether that quote is true or not, it really shows the public connection between Uncle Tom and the Civil War and the fact that the country was at the tipping point and then this was a best-selling book. It was banned in parts of the South and then people started writing books um, in the South about slavery that, that were sympathetic to the slave owners to kind of combat the impact of this book. Um, Uncle Tom's cabin contributed to the outbreak of the war by personalizing, this is important, personalizing the political and economic arguments about slavery. And it did so especially in this, if I can write the full word with my mouse here, in this domestic sphere. So it didn't just look at it didn't just look at the laws from a faraway perspective or talking about, you know, how should this law be worded, etc. It's looking at the home life. It's looking at the personal impact. How does this impact um, Tom? How does this impact Eliza and Harry and other minor characters that we see? Topsy, um, Cassie, Emmeline, all of these people. How are they affected by this? Stowe's informal conversational writing inspired people in a way that political speeches really couldn't. And it helped some people to think about what kind of a country they wanted. I will say that I think a lot of her readers probably were in the North and already had abolitionist leanings, but this kind of, you know, encouraged them further. 
after its publication, um, it was lauded as an achievement and attacked as inaccurate, which I mentioned before. Most liberal abolitionists felt the book was not strong enough and said that Stowe was sort of supporting the um, some of what happened in the book and that it suggested that Tom was not forceful enough because he goes along and is loyal to his master and allows himself to, well, I won't say allows himself, but he doesn't run when he's about to be sold. More moderate anti-slavery advocates and reformers praised the book for putting human face on those held in slavery. So again, this idea that we are thinking about the emotions and the actual impact on families and the plight especially of enslaved mothers. So motherhood, again, you know, kind of I talked about this before, but motherhood being another theme. Pro-slavery forces claimed that slavery was sanctioned in the Bible, that Tom was too noble. So on the one hand, people are like, hey, he should have fought and he should have, um, he could have used violence. That's how bad this situation was. Other people are like, no, no, he's too noble. This is not how slaves actually are. It's unrealistic. It's one-sided. And that's when, as I mentioned, she wrote the key to Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was basically all of her sources annotated and explained. And one of the videos I have linked for you is about Josiah Henson, a slave in Canada, who she had talked to or um, written to, and partially his story um, helped to inspire the book. So we're going to look a little bit at his life as well. So her next novel, Dread, was a little bit more forceful, called for an immediate end to slavery. Um, but this is really the book still that is remembered, the one that was the most famous, that had many plays created from it, none of which she was paid for because of the weird sort of lax copyright rules at the time. Um, but it has become a movie several times. And think in some sense it, it kind of was less popular for a little bit of time after the Civil War because people didn't really want to read about this right um, after slavery was ended and especially with the upheavals of the Civil War, what they had to go through. But later on, scholars kind of rediscovered it and looked at, um, you know, the importance of female writers in American literature and started discussing it. This is about to the same time that Charlotte Temple was kind of rediscovered as an important work by a woman and not just looking at um, the, the traditional canon, which was mostly men, white men. So let's look at an excerpt. Um, I know that this is small, but I wanted to get this whole part in. Um, if you can't read it here, it is in the PowerPoint notes for you on Blackboard. A thousand lives seem to be concentrated in that one moment to Eliza. This is where she is right at the Ohio River. Her room opened by a side door to the river. She caught her child and sprang down the steps toward it. The trader caught a full glimpse of her just as she was disappearing down the bank and throwing himself from his horse and calling loudly on Sam and Andy. He was after her like a hound after a deer. In that dizzying moment, her feet too to her scarce seemed to touch the ground and a moment brought her to the water's edge right on behind they came and nerved with strength such as god gives only the desperate with one wild cry and a flying leap she vaulted sheer over the turbid current by the shore on the raft of ice beyond it was a desperate leap impossible to anything but madness and despair and Haley, sam and andy distinct instinctively cried out and lifted up their hands as she did it. Now, Haley is the slave trader. Sam and Andy are slaves from the Shelby plantation who are supposed to be helping him, but they're trying to allow her to escape. The huge green fragment of ice on which she alighted pitched and creaked as her weight came on it, but she stayed there not a moment. With wild cries of desperate energy, she leaped to another and still another cake, stumbling, leaping, slipping, springing upwards again. Her shoes were gone, her stockings cut from her feet, while blood marked every step. But she saw nothing, felt nothing, till dimly, as in a dream, she saw the Ohio side and a man helping her up the bank. You're a brave gal now, whoever you are, the man said with an oath. 
That means he swore. Eliza recognized the face and voice for a man who owned a farm not far from her old home. Oh, Mr. Sims, do save me. Do save me. Do hide me, said Eliza. Why, why, what's this, said the man. Why, if it ain't Shelby's gal. My child, this boy, he sold him. There is his master, she said, said she, pointing to the Kentucky shore. Oh, Mr. Sims, you've got a little boy. And he replies, well, so I have. And because she's playing with him and, and thinking of her child, he thinks of his child. And that is one of the keys to this book. So this is quite an emotional moment, right? Very high-pitched energy. Um, we are on the edge of our seats hoping, will she get across that river? And when she does, she appeals to the domestic side of this man. Um, that he has a boy and she knows that he may feel similar feelings if it were his boy being sold if it were his boy being ripped away what would he feel like and that appeals to his emotions that appeals to his humanity and that is what helps her to um, fully get across the Ohio River and not be taken back to Haley. So those are some of the themes. I hope that you enjoy the book. Next time I'm going to be talking a little bit more about some of the other features, including some of this language we see down here. And um, yeah, that's it. I look forward to your thoughts. Thanks.